Well, all right. Good evening. All right. We're all the way scattered around the room. We're like good Baptists, right? We don't sit clustered together. We spread out all over the place, right? So uh, that's all right. Tim ought to feel right at home with that, right? You're, you're good with that. Hey, welcome, welcome. Glad you're here tonight as we move into... Um, Just another one of our topics that we're going to look at tonight, we start a two-part time looking at trauma and how we deal with with trauma, either in our lives or helping someone else walk through that. And so uh, as we do that tonight, let me pray for us, and and I'm going to turn it over to Tim and let him him lead us, and we'll just see how the night goes. We'll We'll just go with it, okay? Let me pray for us tonight. Father, we thank you this evening for this chance that we have to gather here. Thank you for this local body of believers uh, called FBC Bernie, uh, where you allow us to do life together. You allow us to walk with one another, uh, to encourage and to edify, um, to strengthen, support, and care for one another. We thank you for the gift that the local church is. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you shed your blood to redeem your bride, the church. And so as we this evening continue to look at how we can be prepared to care for one another, how we have answers in your word to deal with the hurts and the things that we deal with in our everyday lives. God, would you just work tonight? Through your spirit, would you speak to us? God, would you guide Tim tonight and use him? Uh, Thank you for he and Elaine and all that they have done in in preparation for this class that we are having and and God, how it's already making such an impact in so many people's lives and helping us to to think better uh, and to see things from a biblical perspective. God, we thank you for that. We thank you for what you're doing and what you're going to do. Uh, So use this time now, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Well, Elaine is not here tonight. She's on grandmother duty this week, and uh, she and I will team up and have five of our grandchildren over the weekend, so you can pray for us. They're a handful. The older we get, the, the more active they are, it seems. But uh, we are, she's, uh, would have been here, and she's excited about it, just as I am. Uh, so this topic is pretty heavy. Uh, It depends on where you are in this conversation. It's always hard to know where do we jump in. Some of you may be very familiar with the world of trauma. Others others of you are hearing terms, uh, you know, in the news and in the educational system, and and you're hearing trauma-informed care, and you're wondering, what in the world is that anyway? And uh, like a lot of the psychological challenges, uh, we hear information and it we feel somewhat intimidated by it and feel like oh wow that's that's way over my head so i want us to see tonight uh, that trauma is a very common topic a very t- a common issue to scripture and to the gospel so i have taken um two classes out of a 13-week class and so I'm, I'm doing my best to try to give you a really concise overview of trauma, what it is. We'll talk about that tonight, the effects of trauma. And then we'll also get into some of the solutions. Next week, we'll look at more of a practical path toward healing. So uh, stay with me on that. So I want to move quickly tonight because I have a lot of information to cover. Oh, I'm on last week here. Can't, I don't have time to go back. <clears throat> okay. So because this is such a sensitive topic, we always say that if you feel somewhat overwhelmed and you need to leave the room, that is totally okay. Uh, that would be fine. But you may or may not want to process anything uh, that you hear tonight. But let's take it from more of a top-down view and look at what trauma is. Trauma-informed care is really a new term that's come about since about the year 2000. And more and more, we're hearing about trauma-informed care. A lot of effort, a lot of funding is going to creating trauma-informed care in the educational system, the medical profession. It's, it's really comprehensive. 
So if you haven't been introduced to the concept of trauma-informed care, you will. And uh, the church needs to be more and more trauma-informed care. So I appreciate what uh, the leadership here is doing to allow us to, to talk about this, this subject. So let's go ahead and, and look at trauma. A negative or potentially traumatic event or experience that occurs in childhood, doesn't have to occur in childhood, but in this case, in this definition it does. It could be a one-time event, could be a prolonged event or a series of events. And this experience of trauma impacts a, a person's physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual health or well-being. A Miriam Webster tells us that the word trauma comes from the word wound. So to be wounded is to be traumatized. Another definition is individual trauma results from an event, series of events, or set of circumstances that is experienced by an individual as physically or emotionally harmful or threatening and can have lasting adverse effects on the individual's functioning and physical, social, and emotional well-being. In short, trauma disrupts a person's world. There are three main categories for trauma for those that work in this area. They've identified acute trauma, which would result in a single event. For example, you're uh, a victim of robbery on the way home. That's a single event. It won't happen. Maybe it won't ever happen again but that would be a type of acute trauma. There's chronic trauma where you're getting robbed every week. It's happening over and over and over. And uh, then complex trauma, the most complex, and that is where you're exposed to multiple types of trauma, a varied uh, event of, a, of trauma that is very invasive and interpersonal. So this would be, for example, if you experience abuse as a child and then you also experience neglect where there was no one to care for you after coming out of some event, traumatic event of abuse, that's a, a, an example of complex trauma. When we talk about childhood trauma, early childhood trauma refers to these experiences that happened between ages zero and six. And some of the examples of early childhood trauma are there in your notes, natural disasters, sexual abuse, physical abuse, domestic violence or witnessing domestic violence, a medical injury, illness or procedures, community violence, neglect or deprivation, traumatic grief, being a victim of a crime, being kidnapped, being in an accident or experiencing school violence or loss of really any type. So if a child experiences these or others as a child from zero to age six, uh, these events are going to impact this child in a very significant way. In counseling, we talk about presenting problems, meaning that the problem the counselee brings and presents to you as the problem is not usually the real problem. It's usually a consequence of the real problem or a, a uh, what's that word? Symptom, there you go. Who said that? You did it, thank you. Symptom of the real problem. Uh, usually presenting problems are fueled by something much deeper. Uh, the National Center for Biotechnology Information reports that the most common effects of childhood trauma in adulthood are PTSD, or post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSS, which is post-traumatic stress symptoms, depression, anxiety, antisocial behaviors, and they are at greater risk for alcohol and substance abuse, and I think we could add any type of addiction. So the traumas from childhood in many cases will set up a person to implement mechanisms of survival that end up becoming destructive in circumstances that don't require them. So for example, a child that learned to be quiet, to be passive, to be submissive so that they wouldn't get in trouble, when that child becomes an adult, 
That child is probably passive, submissive, and silent because he or she doesn't want to get in trouble. So these, these behaviors carry over because in some way they have worked for the child. Some of the long-term effects of childhood sexual abuse in particular are higher levels of depression, guilt, shame, self-blame, eating disorders, somatic concerns, anxiety, dissociative patterns, repression, denial, sexual problems, relationship problems, having trouble trusting people and bonding with people. These are more, more common symptoms or effects of childhood sexual abuse. Now, you may be familiar with a large study that was done in uh, the mid-90s called the ACE study. ACE is an acronym for Adverse Childhood Experiences. And the Kaiser Permanente and Center for Disease Control conducted this study with 17,000 participants. It was done really to find out how childhood trauma affects the physical well-being of their patients. So this was not a balanced body of our sample of people. Most of the people in this group were white and they had health insurance. So as you can see, it's not going to be as accurate as if you did a more broader sample uh, of the population. However, the study is powerful and it gives us a lot of information that is worth noting. Um, so they came up with three basic categories, that is abuse, neglect, and household dys dysfunction, and they came up with a 10-question uh, assessment to find out how many ACEs does a person have. Uh, so you'll notice, we'll go through these, and I put little check um, underlined so you could put a check by the ones that you have experienced. Don't show this to anyone, and you don't, certainly don't have to show me. But these are the 10 items on this assessment. Did you experience any type of physical abuse in your home as a child? Did you experience sexual abuse? Did you experience any emotional abuse or emotional neglect? Any physical neglect? Was there substance abuse in your home? Did your family go through a separation or a divorce? Did a member of your family have mental illness? Did you witness any violence against your mother in your home? And did anyone in your family have criminal behavior or were they incarcerated? And so those are the 10 items. And the people who checked these boxes would have an ACE score. So if you check two of these, your ACE score would be two. If you check four or five, your ACE score is four or five. So again, as you look at that list, there's a lot missing. They don't have bullying in there. They don't have if you were in a major accident. They don't have if you lost a sibling. I mean, there's a whole list of things that would be classified as traumatic that if you have experienced them, you should put it on the list, even though it's not on this list of 10, just for your own information. Uh, some of the findings from this study were, were shocking. And, and the, the study revealed that people from trauma are more likely to choose destructive ways of living in order to cope than those who are not from trauma. And so if you look at this chart, we'll see a comparison. You'll notice in the box to the left that 33% of this group did not experience any of these adverse childhood experiences. They had a zero score. The larger group, 51%, experienced one to three ACEs, and the other group, 16%, re reported four to 10 ACEs. And you'll notice the outcomes that comparing box one to your left to box uh, three on the right, uh, one in 96 people will attempt suicide if they have a zero score, one in 96. Whereas if they have a score with seven or more, it's one in five that will attempt suicide. And so compared to someone with an A score of zero with someone who has a, a score of four, 
These adults are four times more likely to suffer depression, 11 times more likely to become alcoholics, 16 more times likely to inject street drugs, and 19 times more likely to attempt suicide. So based on ACE research, a teen with an ACE score of zero has a one out of 500 likelihood of attempting suicide by age 18, one out of 500. A teen with a score of seven has a one out of seven likelihood of attempting suicide by his, his or her 18th birthday. Now this shows the potential impact of what happens in childhood and how devastating it can be in the life of an adult. So most trauma-informed educational programs are rooted in this study, based on this study. There's a lot more new information coming out now. I wanted to introduce this to you in case you haven't heard of it so that you would be informed about that. So now let's talk about the effects of trauma. Uh, my friend Dave Lockridge gives this illustration. He says, if you held a plump grape in your hand, in an open hand, it's just sitting there, and all of a sudden it explodes, you would think, that's unusual. I didn't expect that. Like, that's confusing. Why in the world would that grape explode? But if you held that grape between your thumb and your forefinger and you put pressure on it and the grape exploded, that would make sense. You would say, well, of course it's going to explode. So if you think about children, if, you, if children are raised in an environment where they are under tremendous pressure, they have no voice, they have no rescue, they have no relief. At some point, that child is going to explode. Now, what, what that looks like, we don't know, but children from trauma make messes. And that's just the way it is. So we have to be careful as we are assessing people's behavior not to be too quick to judge what's going on in that person's life. And if you are being compelled to be in a type of ministry that cares for other people on a soul level, these things are something you have to pay attention to because these things are deep and very important. The concentration camp survivor, Viktor Frankl, said an abnormal reaction, an abnormal reaction to an abnormal situation is normal behavior. Ed Welch says trauma has the devil's fingerprints all on it. He uses trauma to insert his lies about God and about you. He uses trauma to silence you, to shut you up. He uses trauma to shame you. He wants you to hide who you are from others. He wants to ultimately destroy you. But the good news is that Jesus raises us from the dead. Jesus releases us from the power that death and destruction had over us. The greatest impact of childhood trauma shows up in how the individual views himself or herself. It, it attacks a person's identity. And the way this might develop is a child is verbally abused, hears negative messages, and eventually begins to adopt those messages. So the internal messages that he's been hearing about himself or herself become his or her self-talk. I mentioned in a different class, Paul Tripp said, no one influences you more than you do because no one talks to you as much as you do. So self-talk is a way of perpetuating the lies that were deposited in us whenever trauma occurred. One of the questions I ask guys uh, is I say, hey, what do you tell yourself? Like, what is your self-talk when you fail or when you 
make a really bad mistake. And I almost off, always hear this. You idiot. How could you be so stupid? What's wrong with you? Like just berating questions. Those are not questions, you know. Those are accusations in the form of questions. And sometimes a child might be told, why don't you pay attention? What's wrong with you? Now, of course, if the child was able to just reasonably, calmly answer your question, he might say, well, the reason I'm misbehaving is because the way you treat me is, is horrible. And I feel like even if I answered your question, I would get in trouble for it. So that's why I'm silent. He has learned or she has learned. That's the way you navigate those type of threats. So we call this mentality a shame-based identity, that a person begins to see life through a lens of shame. And shame is a very powerful, powerful force. Many people suffer from a shame-based identity. And when we look back to Genesis chapter 3, we see shame all over that event. I want us to read that. This is Genesis chapter 3, starting in verse 7. After Adam and Eve sinned, then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden. And I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, who told you you were naked? So what we see as what we call the effects of the fall is that Adam and Eve began to interpret everything through a lens of shame. They were ashamed of themselves. They hid themselves. They covered themselves. They didn't even want to see God. They were hiding from love itself. So shame causes us to want to move away from anything that's good. It it wants us to hide. That's the effect of the fall. And God asks this incredible question. Who told you you were naked? And so I think it's a great question for us to consider when we begin to Focus on, okay, shame is causing me to shrink back. Shame is causing me to feel inferior. Shame is causing me to fill in the blank. We need to ask this question. Who told you you were stupid? Who told you you weren't good enough? Who told you you would always fail? Who told you no one would ever love you? Who told you those things? Where'd you get that from? It's a great question. That's not to place blame on anyone. That's just to learn and to try to find a reference point because there's a reason why we're the way we are. There are reasons for the choices we make. The message of shame says something is wrong with you. Shame, again, attacks your personhood, your identity. And so the more... We, when we work with people, we need to be able to ask what has happened to you, not what's wrong with you. And really, when you're frustrated with someone who's making bad choices, the first question that tends to come out of our mouths is, what's, what's wrong with you? Like, what's wrong with you? And that may not be the right question. Maybe the better question is, what has happened to you that has caused you to be in the situation you're in? What is your story? Uh, Many adults struggle with shame. And here's an example of how this might play out. So the original negative messaging may come from a parent, a sibling, a bully, or someone else. So this child is hearing this message. The message becomes so pervasive and consistent that the child believes it is true. Eventually, the child adopts these messages as her own. At that point, the child doesn't need anyone outside of her 
to tell her these things because she's doing this to herself. Now she is repeating these negative messages about who she is as a person without any help. So she doesn't need the devil anymore. She doesn't need the bully anymore. All by herself, she is on a self-destructive path because of the, the lies she is believing about herself and trauma has set her up for those beliefs. She believes a lie, but she believes it's true. So it's going to take something to interrupt that system. And that would be the Lord Jesus to help her to see that what she's believing is a lie. So the child develops mechanisms to navigate threatening situations. And as I said earlier, even when this child becomes an adult, those those, that system, that survival system is well entrenched and, and she will continue to use it even though it is no longer necessary. Some of the effects of shame or trauma, um, which all are rooted in self-absorption and a focus on self, here are some of the effects of trauma. We've already talked about shame. Something is wrong with me. I'm not normal. I just want to be normal. A powerlessness, the feeling that I can't accomplish anything. I need others. I I am a victim. Insecurity. No one really cares about me. No one really loves me. Self-contempt or self-hatred. I deserve to be punished. A fear of rejection. It's very heightened. Uh, fear of failure. I will probably fail, so why should I try? Emotional dysregulation, mood swings, or extreme emotional responses. Uh, Emotional ignorance, not really knowing what he or she is feeling at any any given time. Emotional uh, um, detachment, being isolated or emotionally distant from other people. So the person who has been Uh, abused, let's say, finds that there is no safe place. There's no one who is safe to trust. So the isolation becomes protection, but really it becomes a prison that needs to be uh, broken out of. There's the inability or maybe the unwillingness to trust. Ignorance of one's true needs, not knowing what he or she needs. The inability to form deep, lasting relationships. Feeling life is overwhelming. Feeling one has no voice, that my opinions don't matter. And there may be other effects of trauma that you have experienced or someone you know may have other things going on. But these items give us a really good idea of what types of predictable outcomes trauma might have in a person's life. As far as coping choices, some of the things that are seen commonly are anger, outward outbursts, or inward brooding. We talked about anger. Uh, Passivity, disengaging, not assuming responsibility, choosing to rather be dependent on someone else rather than independent. Uh, Avoidant, withdrawing, avoiding intimacy, avoiding risks. Uh, hiding their true self. They don't feel comfortable being known by someone else. They're reading the room constantly, constantly scanning to see what is acceptable and what is not. If there's any risk that their true self would be rejected, that will not come out. They will keep that inside. Uh, Performance-oriented, doing what others expect or rebelling against what others expect. Perfectionism, uh, the inability to to accept human flaws, having a victim mentality, feeling powerless, blaming others, not taking responsibility, forms of addiction, alcohol, drugs, etc. These are common coping mechanisms for adults who have come from trauma. But as an adult, It's important for us to realize that we are responsible uh, 
We're responsible for how we react, not only to people and circumstances currently, but how we react to our past hurt and trauma. We do have a choice, even though you may feel like you don't have a choice, you actually do have a choice. This is really important for the person who is feeling powerless, like a victim, nothing uh, that they can't really do this on their own. Uh, they're hopeless, they're depressed. Responsibility is very important. And so I've taken that time to try to give sort of a clear understanding of what trauma is and what the effects of trauma might be. Now let's look at the gospel and how it relates to trauma. So the question is, does the gospel have anything to say about trauma? Does it offer solutions? Uh, well, trauma is not a new concept to Scripture. Uh, we just looked at the Genesis 3 account of the fall of humanity. It was, in many respects, uh, a traumatic, catastrophic event, an event that changed the world. When you look at the fall, it left man, humankind, spiritually dead, separated from God, psychologically confused with guilt and shame, socially embarrassed, they covered themselves, and now susceptible to physical sickness and death. And as Ephesians 4.12 explains, having no hope and without God in the world, man in every way is broken by sin. That event was the most traumatic event that the human race has ever experienced. We don't even realize to what extent that event impacts us today. It is huge. It is pervasive. It is, it's almost unexplainable. It is the most traumatic event ever. So trauma is not a new thing to the world. But as I said earlier, trauma changes your world. It's not just a little bump in the road. It is a head-on collision, collision with a Mack truck. It is, it is impactful in every possible way. Now, there are countless examples in Scripture. We'll look at a few of them here in a moment. But let me say that from a macro perspective, we could easily say that every person has been traumatized by sin and Satan. No exception. We have all been enslaved, bullied, abused, manipulated, minimized, considered unimportant or unworthy, and left for dead, all of us. That is our condition before coming to Christ. Now, the world, people who are believers and people who are not believers, have all experienced trauma. Time Magazine article reports that 75% of people will experience a traumatic event in their lifetime. 75% of people. That same article says this, despite the physical pain they suffered, the daily struggles they faced, the lives were, their lives were unquestionably better today than before their traumatic experiences. Trauma set, sent them on a path they never would have found otherwise. Now, this is both hopeful and very challenging. It's hopeful in the fact that trauma survivors can somehow use the tra trauma in their life as stepping stones to a productive life. There are lots of people who have been traumatized who have learned to live a fairly healthy life. It's also challenging because we question as believers, why did God allow such horrible events to happen? It makes no sense that a good God would allow such horrible, evil things to happen to an individual, especially a child. So these are very challenging questions. But... Statistics show that even people who have experienced trauma have been able to overcome that trauma. So we said earlier that Merriam-Webster defines trauma or says that trauma 
comes from the word wound. So when we talk about soul wounds, we're talking about trauma that has impacted a person to where they can't really function uh, in a healthy way. But when we look at biblical terms for trauma, one of the words we, we see in, in Scripture is the word needy, which doesn't, uh, doesn't jump out off the page at a glance, but listen to how this word is used. 1 Samuel 2, 8 he raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honor. Now, I don't know if you, we don't have time to, to talk about the beauty of that passage, but God is taking us from the ashes and he's place, placing us in a place of honor. That's the great exchange. Psalm 918, for the needy shall not always be forgotten and the hope of the poor shall not perish forever. Psalm 69, 33, for the Lord hears the needy and does not despise his own people who are prisoners. So the needy are the people who cannot help themselves, people who have been crushed and oppressed and abused. Another word used for trauma is brokenness or brokenhearted. And here's the, the passage we we get this from Psalm 34, 18 says, the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Brokenhearted is defined as crushed or contrite or crushed to powder. That life has basically just run you over and you are crushed by the experiences you have had. And the 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 Lord is near to the brokenhearted and he saves, rescues, delivers those that are crushed in spirit. Isaiah 61, one reminds us, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and opening of the prison to those who are bound. Jesus said, I did not come uh, to, for, the, for the well. I came for the sick. The well don't need a doctor. The sick need a doctor. And when we read Isaiah 61, we, we see a picture of a broken people who cannot help themselves. And life has just ripped them to shreds. And only God can really heal that brokenness. So as we look at biblical characters, here are a few. Number one, Jesus probably suffered more than anyone. Uh, Isaiah 53, 3 says, he is despised and rejected by men. He's a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. That chapter goes on to talk about the ways he suffered. But when we look at his life in the gospel, just a quick glance, we see him as a child. Uh, Herod tried to kill him. When he was a toddler, he was misunderstood and persecuted as a teacher. He was accused of being insane, mentally ill by his own family. He was betrayed by a disciple, one of his students. He was abandoned by his friends. He was illegally arrested and accused. He was publicly humiliated, beaten unjustly to the point of death almost to the point of death, publicly executed to, by crucifixion as a common criminal, and not to mention he was abandoned by his father on the cross. This is trauma. This is significant trauma. We look at Joseph in the Old Testament, a picture of Christ, and we see that he was favored by his dad. You would think that was a good thing, except... His brothers didn't think that was a good thing. So his brothers singled him out. They bullied him. They made fun of him. They called him names. He was kidnapped, thrown into a well by people who were supposed to be protecting him. That's, that's abuse. He was falsely accused after being sold into slavery. He was thrown in prison for a crime he didn't commit. He was abandoned by the, 
one guy he helped who got out. He forgot about him. And Joseph would summarize all of this trauma in verse 20 of chapter 50 in the book of Genesis by saying, as for you, talking to his brothers, you meant it, you meant evil against me. There's no question about it. He's not giving them a pass. He's not saying, oh, I know you had your own problems and uh, it's okay, I understand. No, 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 you, you did evil against me and you meant it, you intended it. But God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. This verse kind of reminds me of that quote from the, that New York Times uh, article, Time Magazine, sorry, where Joseph was able to look at all this trauma in his life and wasted days and wasted years and see how God had used all of that to put him in a position to save all these people. So God brought him from the ash heap and he put him in a place of honor. He took him from a place of uselessness and put him in a place of usefulness. He took all of that trauma and he created something beautiful and only God could do that. And that's what he does with our trauma. I wished it would happen quicker, but that's what he does with our trauma. Now, when you look at the Apostle Paul briefly, he experienced trauma. Five times he received 39 lashes. Three times beaten with rods. He was stoned, shipwrecked, imprisoned several times. Yet his attitude was, I am what I am by the grace of God. He gloried in these sufferings for Christ's sake. A very positive attitude, though he had experienced tremendous trauma. David is another example. So many things about David we could list, but he was betrayed by his friends, hunted like a criminal. His own son conspired to dethrone him. The Roman believers under Nero's rule suffered persecution, death, loss of family and friends. And I don't know, perhaps Paul anticipated the persecution that would come to these Roman believers when he wrote in, in Romans chapter 8, verse 18, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. That is a, an ashes to honor passage. He goes on in verse 35 to say, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, shall distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? We could add trauma because that's all trauma. As it is written, for your sake, we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. There is hope for God's people, even though we have gone through tremendous trauma. Just in our history, in the Civil War, four years span, the number of soldiers who died between 1861 and 1865, generally estimated at 620,000, is approximately equal to the total American fatalities in the Revolutionary War, the War of 1812, the Mexican War, the Spanish-American War, World War I, World War II, and the Korean War combined. Can you imagine living in the days of the Civil War? Can you imagine the trauma that people endured, the loss, the suffering, the death they endured? No, trauma is not a rare commodity. Trauma is pretty common in a broken world. So there are three primary types of suffering we could, we could cite here. And the, the first one is we, we suffer because we live in an evil, broken world. 
And things happen, natural disasters. Things happen that, that we, we can't blame anyone for. They just happen. That's one source of suffering. Another is we suffer at the hands of others. Much of the New Testament writing on suffering has to do with people experiencing things unjustly. They didn't deserve it. It was wrong for them to be treated the way they were. So they suffer at the hands of other people. We also suffer at our own hand. We are self-destructive in our own nature. We do not seek what is good outside of the life of Christ in us. We will take a destructive path if we're left to our own devices. So there's self-inflicted wounds, poor decisions, self-sabotage, and other ways that we uh, tend to harm ourselves. Fact is, when we mishandle trauma in our lives, we compound and exacerbate the original problem. When we use sinful and other coping mechanisms to comfort ourselves, to escape from the pain, we inadvertently inflict our own souls with more trauma. And it feels like a temporary solution in the moment, but it is actually making the problem worse. It's like scratching poison ivy. You have a little relief on the front end, but it just makes it worse. Now, as a believer is growing in their relationship with the Lord, there will be progressive moments of growth and healing. Uh, but the, the problem with most believers is not so much in his or her relationship with the Lord as it is with his or her relationship with himself or herself. In other words, I, I often ask people who say, I, you know, I, my relationship with the Lord is really not where it needs to be. That's why I'm caught up in this sin or that sin. And I'm, I, I just ask the question, do you think that is the case? Because if you're a believer, you have a relationship with the Lord, right? You're his son. I mean, you can't just decide today, I'm not gonna be your son today or your daughter. I mean, that is your relationship. Whether that's good or bad, it is a relationship. Uh, you're not gonna change that. However, your relationship with yourself is probably pretty volatile. Are you kind to yourself? Do you love yourself the way Christ loves you? Do you forgive yourself, embrace his forgiveness? Are you kind, gracious, patient with yourself the way he is to you? Usually the answer is not really. So we are internally conflicted. We looked at that in a, in a different class. But trauma intensifies that internal, convict, uh, conf, internal conflict and confuses where the original problem resides. So when we look at the gospel and the hope that it offers, the good news of Jesus, hope and healing is found in this relationship with Jesus, not in self-improvement. There's a tendency to want to outperform your trauma, to outrun your past. You figure, well, if I can get far enough away from it, it won't bother anymore, me anymore. But I can promise you, it runs faster than you. It will catch up with you. So working harder will not enable us to overcome the past. Uh, as we embrace who we are in Christ and the love of God, we begin to see hope and embrace it. So the theological solution of the gospel is that Jesus is the healer of the broken. Look at this incident, this scene out of uh, Luke chapter four. It's taken us back to Isaiah 61, but I want us to read it. He was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah, and when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. 
He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, to and, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. I am the good shepherd of Psalm 23. I am the, re the rescuer of Isaiah 61, the healer of the broken. Now, let me just say, and I don't want to stress this point too much, but just to emphasize that this is ministry. What we just read, this is the ministry of Jesus. So the church should be involved in this type of ministry. This is where the Holy Spirit's at work, bringing broken people to the healer. So when you think about the ministry of Jesus, he brings healing to the brokenhearted. This speaks to the world of trauma. He sets captives free. This speaks to the world of addiction. He's relieving those who are oppressed, depressed, overwhelmed, crushed, bruised. So Jesus enters the messiness of our lives and brings real practical relief because that is the gospel. That is what Jesus does. So yes, I'm all for people getting saved and going to heaven. I'm all about that. But we're not there yet. This is where we live. We live among, among broken people. Some are believers already. Many are not, but we're all broken. We all need the gospel, the good news of this redemption that Jesus brought for us. Now, you can just imagine what the heart of God must be like when we read that passage out of Isaiah 61. Now listen to this out of Hebrews 4. You're familiar with this, but just look at it through the lens of how Jesus heals the broken. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who is in every who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then, with confidence, draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. This is the heart of our high priest. He does, he's not irritated by your brokenness. He sympathizes with our weaknesses. Several words in this passage are important. He says, come to the throne of grace confidently, boldly. Because if you know him, if you really know his heart, you don't run away from him. You run fast to him because you know he has invited you to come. And then he says, you may obtain uh, mercy and grace. Now, mercy, in my mind, if we drew a line, uh, and this line represents today, mercy uh, is applied to our past, whether that's years or minutes. Mercy covers. Mercy forgives. Mercy takes away judgment, punishment, etc. Grace is God's ability, God's power, God's uh, strength to move forward. So we need mercy for forgiveness. We also need grace, the power to overcome the things that are obstacles in our life. And then he says you can find help in the time of need. That word help uh, actually means to frap. I didn't know what that was, so I had to look that up. Uh, to frap. So if you take a... a, a a piece of rope that's frazzling and you, you uh, melt it or you secure it, you frap it, uh, you stop it from unraveling. Or you, you, uh, for a ship, 
they would take ropes and wrap the ship in, in rope and frap it so that the storms would not demolish the ship. It would secure it. And so that's the word that's used here in this passage of Hebrews that we will find help, security, strength, stability if we come to the throne of grace in our time of need. And then it says that he sympathizes, sympathizes with us. And that word just simply means same feeling or same emotion. So this is really hard for me to actually grasp. It really is that God would feel what we feel. But this tells us he does. He feels it. So whatever you're feeling in your darkest moments, he's feeling that with you. We'll end with the invitation out of Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 tonight. Jesus says, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I may have already said this before, but you look at the Exodus and the Hebrews coming out of Egypt and God is establishing a brand new nation. And in the Ten Commandments, he places as a law, you shall take a day off. You shall rest. And I thought, Lord, why do you have to force them to rest? Because they never would have rest. They had no reference point for rest. They were slaves. They didn't get days off. They didn't care for themselves. They didn't know how to do that. They just worked and worked. They were used by other people. It was, it was a drudgery of a life. So they get into this new season with God as their king and leader. And he says, you're going to take a day off. If for nothing else to remind you that you are no longer a slave and everything in you on the Sabbath is going to want to go do something to, pr to prove your, your worth, but I want you to rest because your worth is not in, you, in your work. Your worth is your, in your identity and your relationship with me. He said, if you will take his yoke and start learning from him, you will find rest for your soul. So just in summary tonight, trauma is not beyond the gospel. Jesus was traumatized. He understands our trauma. He sympathizes with our struggles and he invites us to bring our burdens to him and to learn from him, learn something different. Let me pray and then we can, if we have time, we have questions. Lord, thank you again for these beautiful words. Uh, Lord, that regardless how sophisticated trauma conversations become, the simple solution is a relationship with you, is for you to heal our brokenness. Sometimes that's more complicated in some of us than others. But Lord, you will never give up on us. You will not stop until we are conformed to the image of Christ that when we see you, we will be just like you. Thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much, Tim. Can we thank mm. Tim again for mm. tonight? Mm. So, so good. Um, and I know next week we'll, we'll add more to this. And, and we'll look at our path, path forward. Pa that's good. Path forward. That will be good. But a couple of things I just want to remind you of that were said tonight as we leave here. Um, Trauma is not like, well, I think one of the things we feel is we have to explain why to people. If we're walking with someone through trauma, or maybe we're dealing with it in ourselves, right? We want to why. Why did this happen, right? We think that somehow that is what's going to help provide healing 
and those kinds of things. But what you said was so good. It's, it's, it's the hope that we have in the gospel, that Christ can take that trauma, that thing that can't be explained, right? That thing that it, it may be senseless, it is evil, it may be wicked, right? It's just, it's just, we don't have to feel this weight and pressure to try to come up with a, a narrative that explains it. We can just acknowledge it's there, say it is messy, but because of the hope that we have in Christ, we can wade through the mess in our own life or with someone else and know that with confidence that God can bring healing in the midst of it and bring us out restored on the other side. I thought that was so good. And I just wanted to highlight that again tonight because I think that is one of the things we, we feel in our own lives and, and when we're walking with others through that is this pressure to fix it. And that's not what we're called to do, right? We're called to just point to Jesus. We're called to just walk with someone knowing that he ultimately through the cross and through the empty tomb has brought healing already in restoration. So thank you for pointing that out because I think sometimes that's what we need in order to step into those situations is just knowing that truth that that doesn't change. So look forward to next week talking through a path forward. Um, Guys, get out of here a couple minutes early, all right? We're going to, well, maybe we'll grab those two minutes another week and keep you two minutes longer, but I'm going to let you go two minutes early tonight, okay? Good night.